All right, Bona Seda, what's poppin'? It's your boy, Big Rich, Mob Story Season 2. Time for some early Wednesday evening business, like I like to say. Gentlemen, you know the routine. Wipe your feet on the rug, blow some smoke in the atmosphere. I just lit up some black fire. Mean, yeah, it's delicious. Let's get busy. Of course, this evening's video is brought to you by Justice Tech Pros. Thank you for sponsoring tonight's show. Subscribe to Justice Tech Pros on YouTube. Salute to Dominic and the whole team. From the button, guys, at the NewYorkMafia.com. The Cherry Hill Gambinos, part five. Rosario steps into the ring, written by MS. The setup. Quote, we've been framed. This is all a setup, unquote. Rosario Gambino after his 1980 arrest for drug trafficking. Back in March of 1981, Rosario was to have gone on trial with his brother Joe. But because of medical issues... He had polyps on his throat. His case was severed and set for a later date. He had presented the court with medical proof of his condition. However, when the issue came up, U.S. District Attorney Mark Summers was suspicious and told the press that he believed Rosario was trying to alter his appearance before the trial. In January of that year, law enforcement had also begun circulating a rumor. Around the same time of the SS poet debacle, that Rosario had received a dead fish in the mail. Supposedly, he had moved out to Cherry Hill, and sources told the press that the dead fish was mailed to his home in Cherry Hill and forwarded to his new address in Brooklyn. When asked why Rosario would have received such a thing in the mail, the anonymous sources related a story about dead fish and mafia lore and speculated that he had received this special gift because of the upcoming trial. The story certainly made for good newspaper fodder while Rosario was waiting for his day in court, the highest authority. Rosario stepped into the courtroom in August 1981. Like his brother, who had already been acquitted by this time, Rosario was facing charges of distributing heroin and conspiracy to distribute heroin. Also like his brother, Rosario had to face testimony from the prosecution's main witness, Francesco Roli, a disgraciado. Only this time, Rodi had told the court that Rosario was the mastermind of the drug trafficking scheme. He said Rosario was the main guy, the highest authority, even though back in March he had claimed that Joe was the man in charge. Raleigh added that Rosario was the one who had almost killed Paul Zinerko, taking him to a house in Brooklyn, hanging him in the rafters with a telephone cord, shoving a gun in his mouth, and demanding to know where the missing heroin was. But this go-around, the jurors believed at least part of Rowley's story. Rosario was acquitted on the distribution charge, but the jury was hung on the conspiracy one. He would have to return to court in February of 1982 to face that charge. After the trial, Rosario's lawyer, Jacob Eversoff, told reporters if his name was in Gambino, he would have never been prosecuted. When Rosario returned to court in February of 1982, the case was over in a week. Rosario was acquitted of the conspiracy charge as well. Salute. Despite their acquittals, law enforcement was applying as much pressure as they could in every way they could on the Gambino brothers. Under pressure. In November of 1981, Joe was found guilty of liquor license violations at Valentino's, now New York, New York, by the New Jersey State Division of Alcohol Beverage Control, or better known as ABC. He was accused of failing to keep proper books and had apparently employed people with arrest records. The ABC had a strict rule regarding people with arrest records working and established with, with a liquor license. These criminally disqualified persons weren't allowed to work at restaurants serving liquor. Through his lawyer, Joe claimed he didn't know about the arrest records because the employees had lied on the applications. Valentino's liquor license was suspended for 60 days. Joe tried to reinstate his license, but was unsuccessful after numerous attempts. Even in 1984, Joe was making an attempt to get the license back, but was repeatedly blocked by the Cherry Hill Town Council. The council was reluctant to reissue a license to someone with his reputation, referring to Joe's 1980 drug smuggling charge for which he was acquitted. The town solicitor, Ralph Kimiak, said that despite Joe's acquittal, he believed the 1983 tax evasion charge was another consideration as to why Joe shouldn't receive a new liquor license. Quote, if I remember the statutes, Kimiak said, the tax evasion is an offense of moral turpitude. 
Eventually, Joe gave up the idea of reopening his beloved restaurant and much later apparently built a condo complex on the property. The following year, John faced his own legal challenges, but surprisingly got a little unexpected help from Uncle Sam. Uncle Sam takes sides. The famous Italian judge, Giovanni Falcone, had an eye, had his eye on John Gambino since even before the 1970 Sedona affair. And after January 25th, 1982, he finally got his man, or so he thought. In a thousand-page indictment, John was charged along with 75 others for being involved in a heroin smuggling ring, which Falcone claimed was a $560 million a year business. I say it again, a $560 million a year business with money laundered and then reinvested in real estate in Italy. That's how you're supposed to do it. As closely as Italy and the U.S. had been working together to put a stop to heroin smuggling allegedly perpetrated by the Gambino brothers, the indictment took the FBI by surprise. They claimed they had no idea it was coming. Still, while the two countries had a common goal, U.S. authorities refused to extradite John, who became a legal U.S. citizen in 1964. John was convicted in absentia at a later date and sentenced to seven years in prison. As long as he stayed out of Italy, he wouldn't be arrested, but his conviction would come back later to haunt him. Meanwhile, there was a restaurant war brewing in Cherry Hill, the Burning Bridge. Apparently, the alleged pizza wars of the late 1970s had crossed over to restaurant businesses as well, as, as well by the early 1980s. In October 1982, Valentino's New York, New York was heavily damaged in a fire. Local police suspected arson. They also believed the fire was part of a war between Joe Gambino and Franco Longo, a Sicilian immigrant who owned a nearby disco called Franchins. Franchins had been damaged by a fire the day before the fire at Valentino's. Longo dismissed the rumors, telling a local newspaper, that's garbage, I tell you, that's not true. He said that he and Joe Gambino were friendly, that Joe had eaten at his restaurant many times and that he never felt threatened by his competitor. Law enforcement didn't believe that Longo was mob-connected. However, Longo had gone to the police the previous year claiming that he was roughed up by a few alleged Gambino associates. He also claimed at the time that he had been receiving calls at all hours telling him to get the fuck out of Cherry Hill. Longo decided not to press charges and the matter was dropped. The arsons at both restaurants were never solved. Things in Cherry Hill remained quiet for a time until... That 1980 drug trafficking case finally came around in Italy. Italy's hit parade. Even though both Joe and Rosario had been acquitted in the U.S. for the 1980 drug trafficking charges, they still faced trial in Italy. In June of 1983, the brothers were convicted in absentia, the sentence to 20 years each. Others who were charged in the case were convicted in Italy as well. Emanuele Adamita received 20 years. Dominico Adamita received 18 years. And Antonio Adamita received 15 years. A month after the Italian convictions, U.S. District Attorney Mark Summers, who tried 14 defendants in Brooklyn, reflected on the case in an interview with the Democrat and Chronicle newspaper in Rochester, New York. Out of the 14 defendants he tried, only two were convicted, Zanerko and Silvestrini. It was a reality for which Summers was not proud. He told the newspapers it happened because the trials were held separately. The judges would let us put all evidence before the jury, Summers said, so that none of the juries heard the whole scheme. But at least he was able to keep his promise to Francisco Roli and John Aguito. Both of the El Italia cargo handlers had pled guilty, but because of their assistance with the case, they had only been sentenced to one day's probation. Rats. Disclasia. And neither was charged in Italy. The drug trafficking case was finally and completely over, but that didn't mean things were going to stay quiet in Cherry Hill for long. Big surprises. Mateo and Salvatore Solena were brothers who were soldiers in John's crew and owned several pizza parlors in the New Jersey and Philadelphia areas. Salvatore had been one of the men convicted in absentia in Italy for the 1980 drug trafficking case. 
Within days of each other, in November 1983, both had been found shot dead in the head multiple times, their body wrapped in green trash bags and stuffed in the trunk of a car. Philadelphia mobster turned informant Yogi Merlino, a disgracia, later claimed Joe Gambino was behind one of the murders and that the Solena brothers were killed because they had been stealing money. When a local newspaper contacted law enforcement for more details after the murders, one source said, quote, it may come as a surprise to you, but these guys really don't file an operational plan with us telling who they're going to kill and why. Matter of fact, I don't remember them holding any press conference either, unquote. It would make things a lot easier, but it would take a lot of fun out of it. They'd rather kill someone and make it a big surprise for us the press, and most importantly, the target. Then they dare us to figure out who did it and why and hope we could prove it. Although law enforcement tried to tie the Gambino brothers to the killings, nothing ever came of it and the murders were never solved. While law enforcement displayed a rare sense of humor, the same could not be said about the IRS. Beware the tax man. Please do. On December 29, 1983, Joe and Rosario were indicted by a federal grand jury on tax evasion charges. The charges were brought one month before the statute of limitations was set to expire. The IRS claimed the Gambino brothers had defrauded them of $17,700 in taxes by falsifying a corporate federal income tax return. They were also accused of misleading the First People's Bank of Haddon Township. These charges stemmed from Joe and Rosario's failed attempt to open the Don Giovanni restaurant in Cherry Hill back in 1978. When they couldn't open the restaurant, the brothers had sold the property to the Victoria Station restaurant chain for $500,000. The IRS said Joe and Rosario listed a $90,000 check as an expense which reduced their net profit to just little over $350 on the sale. The IRS further claimed that the check was written to a fake person by the name of Gianni Palazzo and that Palazzo was in actuality Rosario Gambino, who then cashed the check and pocketed the cash. If convicted, the two would face 10 years in jail and a $120,000 fine each. The case wouldn't go before a jury until February 1985. By the end of 1983, Joe had decided to move out the increasingly hostile Cherry Hill area back in Brooklyn. It's unclear when exactly Rosario jumped ship, but no matter when he did, he couldn't escape the penetrating eye of law enforcement. Hammer of Injustice. On March 16, 1984, Rosario was arrested on charges of conspiracy to distribute heroin, distribution of heroin, and the illegal use of the telephone. Nine others were arrested with him, including his brother-in-law, Erasmo Gambino, and cousins Antonio Gambino, Anthony Spatola, and Mario Gambino. Rosario's bail was set at $10 million, even though he had no prior felony convictions. In fact, aside from his March 1980 arrest, he had only minor arrests and was only convicted twice, in 1962 as an illegal alien and in 1969 on a reduced charge of criminal trespassing after a brawl with a police officer. To add to the drama, Antonio Gambino, according to law enforcement, tried to kill himself shortly after being arrested by ramming his body against the bars of his jail cell. He survived. Around this time, the Pizza Connection case was also kicking into high gear, so it was a headline coup for the federal government. Rosario's father's old friend, Tommaso Busquera, had become a key witness in that case, a disgracia, which would last through 1987, and John's good friend and associate, Sal Catalano, would later be convicted along with many others. In September of 1984, Rosario once again stepped into the ring with the U.S. justice system. In the trial, DEA agents reported that they had purchased eight ounces of cocaine and two pounds of heroin from Anthony Spatola and Antonio Gambino with a promise of future purchases of 10 pounds of heroin per month for an undetermined amount of time. The agents had posed as Las Vegas drug dealers. U.S. District Attorney Marianne E. Murphy said during her opening arguments that Erasmo and Rosario quote, kept themselves off stage while maintaining absolute control, unquote, over the others. 
She also claimed the defendants used code words such as pizza, champagne, spare tires, cars, and marriage during telephone conversations to talk about the drug operation. The government alleged that prior to the sale, Anthony and Antonio had turned to their cousin Erasmo, who then turned to Rosario to procure the heroin. However, prosecutors weren't able to provide evidence that Rosario was the man behind the scenes. The agents hadn't purchased the heroin directly from Rosario, and in all of their surveillance footage, there was not one image of Rosario entering or leaving any of the Brooklyn cafes they claimed were heroin auction houses. The only footage they had was of Rosario's car parked outside the Cafe Milano. But after the agents had purchased the heroin in an Atlantic City hotel room in exchange for $100,000 in cash, they followed the cousins who had driven immediately back to Rosario's home. Whether they were there to discuss Rosario's upcoming surgery as the defense claimed or to deliver proceeds from the sales as the prosecution claimed is up for debate. The only thing that is certain, though, is that after Rosario was arrested, $200 bills from the drug sale were found in his dresser after authorities searched his home. The defense did everything they could to dissuade the jury that no exchange of money had been made. Rosario's attorney, Jacob Eversoff, even used the old standby that if Rosario's Gambino's names was Schwartz, he would not be sitting at this table. But it was to no avail. The Book of Lies. One can speculate that many one of Rosario's cousins owned him money and that's why he had the cash. But in the world of law, this kind of evidence is known as circumstantial evidence and can be used by juries in their deliberations. After a six-week trial and five days of deliberations, the jury had reached their verdict and this time it wasn't in Rosario's favor. On October 23, 1984, Rosario, Erasmo, Anthony, and Antonio were found guilty of all charges. Mario Gambino had been previously acquitted. If that wasn't enough, the government had something even better, or shady, depending on how you look at it, up its sleeve. Prior to Rosario's sentencing hearing, prosecutors delivered a 30-page memorandum to the court to assist U.S. District Judge Frederick B. Lacey with his sentencing decision. In this mini-novel, prosecutors included FBI reports that outlined their belief that Rosario was a suspected leader of the Cherry Hill faction of the Gambino family. The prosecution also provided detailed speculations about his involvement in the pizza and cheese war controversy of the late 1970s, suspicions that he was trying to take over competing pizzerias in South Jersey and Philadelphia, information about the files provided to him via Luis Epolito and Rosario's alleged involvement in the Sedona kidnapping. It also included information of the 1980 heroin trafficking charge for which he had been acquitted. Whether the government included the speculation about the far-fetched and outlandish SS poet hijacking plot is unknown. And in an added bonus... The Bureau of Tobacco and Firearms, the ATF, included a report that they had recommended charges be filed and prosecution sought against Rosario and Joe for arson and extortion attempts that they believed the brothers had committed against three pizza shops in South Jersey back in the late 1970s. The ATF made it even more exciting by detailing a rumor that Rosario had allegedly burned one of the cars of a pizza shop owner and then called the manager threatening, how do you like what we've done to your car? What I did to your car. I'm going to do it to you if you don't do what you're told. I'm going to take a gun in my hand and blow your face off. Get wise, get smart, close up, and turn in your keys. After presenting the voluminous memo, U.S. District Attorney Murphy, in her quest for a headline-worthy soundbite of her own, said, quote, The range of activities and Rosario Gambino's demonstrated attitude toward the legal system offer convincing proof that he has little, if any, potential for rehabilitation. The defense argued that much of the information in the memo was unsubstantiated and was information for which Rosario was never arrested, indicted, or convicted. Even Murphy herself couldn't explain why charges were never brought against Rosario on any of the claims if law enforcement strongly believed that Rosario had done everything they suspected he did. Still, 
It was a nuclear bomb for Rosario, despite Judge Lacey's assurances that he had only considered the evidence from the trial in determining the sentence. Judge Lacey handed Rosario Gambino a sentence of 45 years in prison, the maximum available. Rosario's lawyer was shocked. His family was shocked. And Rosario was shocked too, turning to Eversoft afterward and explaining 45 years. Rosario had many more travails in his life, which we won't detail here, but he remained and still remains a favorite target of the U.S. federal and Italian law enforcement even at 78 years old. Now that Rosario was out the game, John, Joe, and their associates pushed forward knowing that law enforcement was hot on their heels, and there wasn't many bright spots in the murky waters ahead either. Down but not out. In February of 1985, Joe and Rosario went to trial under tax evasion charges from 1983. During the trial, Joe's lawyer, Alfred Pierce, honed in on the fake person allegation. He said, quote, knowing you are checked by the government at every step, can anyone be so crazy, so dumb to put down the name of a fake person? No way could an intelligent man do what the government said he did. The jury agreed and acquitted the brother of all the charges. After the trial, Pierce told reporters, Pierce told reporters, my client was called dozens of times by the IRS because his name is Joe Gambino. It was a mantra that seemed to be ever present in the Gambino brothers' lives. Later that same year, Joe was arrested for gambling at the Baccarat table at the Tropicana Casino Hotel in Atlantic City. He had been banned the previous September because of his alleged links to organized crime. Sometime in 1985, John suffered a stroke, which ended up giving him a limp, something that would come to play in 1992. The early to mid-1980s had been a trying time for the Gambino brothers, but it was about to get a whole lot worse. John, Joe, and their associates were going to be inducted with a major rat infestation. Disgracia. Thanks in part to the brazen murder of Gambino boss, Paul Castellano in December of 1985 by John Gotti and his faithful servant, Sammy Gravano. Next, part six and the final chapter of the Cherry Hill Gambinos. So first of all, salute to the button guys at www.thenewyorkmafia.com. Salute to MS for writing another great addition to this series. The setup. Salute to everybody. Have a good evening. Let me know what you're smoking on. Leave it in the comment section. Make sure you like, comment, share. And also, if you're a first-time listener, hit that subscribe button and hit that bell so you can get every alert when a mob video goes out. Salute.